Okay, so in the interest of time, I just want to focus on uh, two stories in the lab. Um, and so one is kind of what we've been working on for a while now, but really um, this, into this new area that kind of goes into neuronal reprogramming and, um, and this transcription repressor rest. And then if there's time at the end, I want to tell you about um, sort of the dark side of neurogenesis. So everyone thinks that we want more neurons, we want more neural stem cells, but the truth of the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes more is not always better. And so in, in case there's actually a very nice example in epilepsy or really the development of epilepsy, epileptogenesis, that, that new neurons might not be bad, uh, not be good. And in fact, it may actually contribute to um, epilepsy development. Element. Okay, so um, I'm not sure um, how many of you guys are thinking about brain um, and, and nervous system disorders, but um, some of, some of you, um, you, I've talked to um, a group um, this morning that I'm um, interested in neurodegeneration. So then some of you then obviously appreciate that as, um, you know, brain disorders are, are a, a big problem, um, not just in the U.S., but obviously worldwide, particularly as we do a better and better job at, like, keeping people um, healthy and living longer that now we face this problem of neurodegeneration and so so it's costly and the and there's um, more and more people affected with um, neurodegenerative diseases and so um, so um, so so um, neural repair and regeneration seems to be really um, um, a, a, you know, a likely scenario to try to um, combat this um, and there's hope in stem cells and hope in reprogramming okay so um, but so the pathology of brain injury um, is, is, um, is sort of summarized and simplified on this slide. So in, uh, there's lots and lots of different kinds of um, you know, um, CNS-related injury and pathology. Um, but one of the sort of shared um, you know, features is that in most of these cases, um, the damage is often irreversible. So there's very limited you know, ways of the body's, you know, the brain and the nervous uh, spinal cord's way of sort of trying to repair this naturally. And, um, and although you're living and, you know, you're, you're, um, but the, your quality of life, um, the function of your day-to-day of your, um, um, -to -day, um, you know, routine is, is really severely affected and debilitating. So, um, and that's where, you know, I think we hope to contribute to. So, in, like I, I said, a lot of these damages, be it stroke or seizures or hypoxia, ischemic insults like stroke, so these lost brain cells, they cannot be replaced or repaired. They, they die. Um, so one of the initial things that happen is that the neurons die or they degenerate. And they're replaced by these non-neuronal cells, so mostly these astrocytes. So, no, so the astrocytes are really a critical like, support cell to the neuron. But after injury, they come and they actually proliferate. And they, um, they um, help sort of, you know, with the initial um, damage or kind of like scar tissue. But, um, but then later on, they might be actually inhibitory to, um, degener uh, to regeneration. So although these astrocytes are protective from additional injury or infection, they, they sort of also sort of are a barrier. So we're trying to you know, take advantage of the fact that they are there and after injury and maybe um, they, they can be harnessed. So here's a, just a, um, a card, you know, sort of a section through the, a coronal section through a mouse's brain that have received a stroke. And you can see after stroke, it turns white because it's just dead tissue. But the area around the infarct are all these green, light up green labeled cells, GFAP, which is a marker of astrocytes. And it's, it's really just in this peri-infarct zone, but on the other side, on the contralateral side, you don't see that response. So it's really local. And depending on how big the damage is, that's how um, prevalent this astrocyte proliferation is. And that's what people call reactive gliosis. Okay. So here are just some of a slide summarizing some of the challenges then we face for neuronal reprogramming in the adult brain. Um, so most cells present in the adult CNS are post mitotic. Okay, so unlike maybe the um, you know some other organs like the liver or um, you know skin and things like that, and maybe even limit some limited proliferation in the heart. The in the, in the adult brain, the neurons are completely post mitotic. 
and they cannot be easily recruited to the site of injury. And also, you know, the thought of, you know, changing them or reprogramming them, one worries whether, you know, you're altering the circuits and the function of those intact neurons. Okay, so then in the adult brain, cells have acquired their mature identity, all right? So, so, so even though, you know, we're born, all right, so then, um, yeah, so in the adult brain, cells have acquired their mature identity and they're not as plastic as the embryo. Um, the secreted factors, um, um, it, it's actually been established that there's probably secreted factors. And as I was talking to Mara the, uh, last night, is that in experiments where you actually fuse the circulatory system between a young mouse or an old mouse, that actually you can, you can rescue the diminished um, neurogenesis in the old mouse by just something systemic from the young mouse. And so there's many evidence of secreted factors being important to you know, establish you know, neurogenic areas, stem cells, but there also creates microenvironment in which astrocytes are maintained. And so that these newly formed cells you know, from reprogramming, they must be able to fully integrate and connect to the existing prior circuitry, um, which is not something they're you know, seeing normally in this ad adult environment. So these are just some of the challenges, theoretical challenges. So then, so, so you know, various strategies are um, that people have been dealing with CNS injury is through the use of drugs, pharmacological agents, physical therapy, um, uh, classic cell transplantation like grafting cells, releasing factors, um, surgery to remove the damage or affected tissue or to, you know, to try to preserve the, um, the, um, the circuits. Um, but so this new area, sort of gen regenerative or stem cell therapy, I think that is relatively new, um, probably you know in the last 10 or 15 years. And I think little, so that I think has the most potential to maybe help for brain repair. So, so let me get you um, kind of back to this notion that in the adult brain, which is you know where we're most interested in, um, uh, there is you know pr sort of reservoirs of ongoing neurogenesis. And here is just. Um, a slide. This is a cross section through the rat hippocampus. So it's the it's the hippocampus is important for learning and memory. And in the hippocampus, there's a there's a region called the dentate gyrus. It's the region where um, all the cortical um, input from entorhinal cortex comes in and first connects to the dentate gyrus. So it, you know here you can see um, the granule cells, but in the inner granule cell layer or the subgranular zone, you can see this is BRDU, um, you know, bromodeoxyuridine um, labeled cells, and it's it's very very prevalent. So it's um, this is like a, an adult rat. You can see this in adult mouse, and apparently even in in human tissue of all different ages. Um, people have found you know, um, proliferating cells in the hippocampus that still give rise to granule neurons. And so, and they're, you know, they, they, they um, are marked by this prox one, this granule neuron marker. And then in this, you know, later half of the talk, I'll sort of tell you that in the epileptic brain, you get massive, even more proliferation, but you also have ectopic um, proliferation and migration. <coughs> so, but you know, despite that being exciting and possibly representing you know good news, it's, it is it does you know become limited and restricted to these two regions, the hippocampus uh, that I showed on the previous slide, and also this other region that lines the ventricle, um, and so. The, it's um, you know restricted for some reason, and um, and also that in you know if you looked at um, it's hard to see, but if you compared the extent of proliferation with respect to age, so this is like 10 days all the way to 30 days, the rate is high, and then it progressively um, gets lower and lower with age, um, at different regions. So it's you know highest in the early um, postnatal, but then you know at the later time points, it's, it's very, very low. And most of these proliferating cells that still are there in the cortex and the striatum are glial progenitors. They're, they're the progenitors to oligodendrocytes and to the astrocytes, the myelinating and the non-myelinating glia. So that's unfortunately the reality, okay. 
So then, um, so you know, we, we've been studying adult hippocampal neurogenesis genesis for years and years and years, and we've been learning all sorts of things about their fate program, you know, different transcription factors that are important for making and producing granule neurons. And I'm not going to spend that much time talking about that today, because what I want to do is we, we basically got to a point where we thought we learned all this information, and we know how um, neural stem cells can be, that are normally neurogenic, how do they differentiate and progress. But how can we use that information sort of as a proof of principle, be used that to like reprogram a cell that's in a non-neurogenic environment, to, like, like the cortex, um, where, where you have like hundreds of different neuronal cell types and billions of different neurons. So, um, so then we thought, okay, you know, what, what, if we're thinking about reprogramming, which, um, which, you know, pathway or which um, mode of reprogramming might be preferential. So we started comparing and listing sort of the reprogramming versus the trans differentiation. So, you know, you guys probably know a lot about this because you probably heard from um, Morrow's lab. But, you know, generally reprogramming is, is the typical IPS with the Yamanaka factors, and you kind of have to go through an, a, a pluripotent um, state, right? With, with um, you know, you take cells out. Um, fibroblasts with the Yamanaka factors, you first take them through this induced pluripotent state, then you differentiate them into like a neuron or a cardiomyocyte, and then you transplant them back into the, the, um, the patient. And then the, um, the, the, um, the trans differentiation involves, you know, taking cells from the patient, but using transcription factors that just directly um, promote conversion into the desired cell type and without necessitating that they go through an embryonic pluripotent state. So those are basically the two um, you know, modes of conversion. The trans differentiation is direct. There might be a lower yield of converted cells, but basically there are fewer steps, and you can possibly do this directly in vivo. Okay. So then we're thinking, well, what can be the in vivo cell type we start with? And so and I, I've sort of alluded to this, that astrocytes might be a really good candidate because they're, they normally sort of home in after injury and, and they are naturally proliferative after injury. So they might be like a sort of a broad, you know, applicable source. And also, um, there are a huge number of these cells. So they're, you know, about 50% of the glial population in the adult brain are astrocytes, just at baseline. Like they're quiescent and they're just always there. And in, actually there's a window of time after um, birth for the first three weeks that they still continue to proliferate and they basically what are what responsible for increasing cortical size. So, um, and they have very important functions. Um, you know, listed here, you know, they mainly um, for establishing and maintaining the blood-brain barrier, they regulate pH and ion balance, um, they recycle neurotransmitters, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so we thought, you know, they, they could be really good candidates for reprogramming. And, um, and then there's been a couple of papers already out there suggesting um, that they might be, you know, possible to transdifferentiate astrocytes directly to neurons. Um, but so far, this has been only shown for like the embryonic or the early postnatal period. And so it's really yet to be demonstrated that they can, can be converted in vivo, in, you know, directly to a neuron um, in the sort of late postnatal to adult. So um, that's sort of what, 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 what we're thinking. And this is just an example from Magdalena Gotz's lab that neuron um, directly converted from an astrocyte using neurogenin 2. And now, now um, this is a neuronal marker and, um, you know, sort of in the sea of astrocytes. And so here are just a, li a short list of some other published um, candidates. But like I said, it's, it's really early days. And, um, and so, you know, peop this is kind of like what we're thinking of trying to do. Okay, so then um, and another thing we're trying to do is in addition to using positive factors is maybe we can subtract an essential negative factor of neurogenesis. And it, it just happens that in the last five or so years, that's what we've been working on. And this factor that we've been working on is rest. So it's a, tip, it's, a, it's a transcription repressor. It contains a DNA binding domain that binds DNA. The consensus sequence is known, and it's, been, it's estimated that it actually can bind more, regulate more hundreds if not thousands of mammalian genes, and a lot of them are you know, pro-neurogenic. 
they, um, it's a repressor because it has an N and a C terminal repressor and they recruit additional co-repressors like histone deacetylases that are known to re confer gene repression and also um, um, uh, sort of establish a silent state of um, histone modifications of the repressive nature. Um, through this, these repressor domains. So um, I, I just want to very quickly give you um, some of the, um, a summary of some of the work we published on REST or NRSF and then show you some preliminary data how we use that to show that maybe it could be effective in a reprogramming strategy. So we, we confirmed that REST is expressed in a, the adult brain and it's also in the stem cell compartment. This is um, you know, sort of showing, I, I, we usually use a different markers to mark the stem cells and the progenitor cells as well as the, you know, the differentiated neurons. And we actually find that rest levels are highest in the stem and progenitor cells. It's down-regulated as they differentiate, probably to release and, and you know, allow derepression of these early neurogenic transcription factors. But the rest levels come back on in the mature neurons, probably to maintain um, the neuronal identity. And so, um, so again, to, sh to show that what we did was we generated a flux allele of rest so that we can inducibly and conditionally knock it out in these adult neural stem cells. And, and then once it's deleted there, it'll be permanently deleted there. So this is a schematic of our flux allele and then also how we basically take our um, flux allele, we uh, breed it with a nest, an inducible nesting cree so that we could use tamoxifen in the adult mouse and then and then use this, you know, flock stop, flocks reporter, YFP, so that YFP can track every cell that's recombined. And then again, the long, the, the long story short is that we saw, um, not only did we see an increase of these early neuronal differentiation genes at this early time point when we delete rest, so suggesting that rest is really important to restrain neurogenesis in the stem cell but that we also saw that the quiescent neural stem cells, they normally are quiescent and they rarely divide, but when you delete rest, we see a small but significant number of cells that now um, become proliferative and then they're gonna differentiate. So that's what happens when you, you know, delete this transcriptional repressor in the adult neural stem cell. And so then over time, if you just looked at all the YFP cells and, you know, at different time points after tamoxifen, you see that in the conditional knockout, you're going to get fewer and fewer of these newborn neurons that generate, um, presumably because you're depleting the stem cell um, ability to activate and, and, you know, give rise to new neurons. So, so that and other work um, that, you know, that I don't really have time to share, but it's all published, uh, um, we, we came to this idea that, you know, it's a very good candidate, you know, it's this mass, master negative regulator of adult neurogenesis in this neurogenic area. So, so based on that, we thought, you know, maybe we can, you know, take this to a non-neurogenic area. And although, and, and actually there's a little bit, some um, evidence to suggest that this might really work. So um, it was actually published in you know, 2004 from um, Sadan Majumder's group. These are C2, C12 myoblast cultures. Um, but if you actually generate um, a, a, a REST VP16 version in a, in a retrovirus and infect them in C2, C12 cells, that they, they see conversion of C2, C12 myoblast to these neuronal-like cells. <coughs> and then they confirmed that you can transplant these cells into the cerebellum and they would fire and have, you know, some physiological properties of neuronal cells. And so, but this, so this is basically just taking just the DNA binding domain of rest, lacking those repressors and then putting it to a very strong, um, you know, VP16 activator. So, so um, based on this, we thought, you know, we could possibly start with these astrocytes, um, uh, and and um, be able to then tr uh, you know transduce and overexpress a, a short list of candidate transcription factors, including you know REST VP16, and also maybe doing this um, you know in our REST conditional knockout background. So we could you know do both approaches of removing the repressor and converting the repressor to an activator, and then in parallel we could try some of these other published candidates like you know, that are shown here. Um, and 
Um, so this is not a, you know, a high throughput approach. This is really just a focused candidate approach. And the idea is we would take um, primary cortical astrocytes from P15 and maybe later on try also adult. So we, we've been testing both. The, P, the um, astrocytes from P15 mice or rat grow very well, but from adult, they, you bas they basically, you know, you take them out, they proliferate maybe a limited period of time, and then they just stop growing. So, so um, it, it was a lot more trickier to do this from adult, and then we convinced ourselves that maybe that's not totally necessary to do that at this point. Um, but to start with the P15, because it allows us just to do more these experiments. And then we could then, you know, try to get this transdifferentiation with candidate factors. And then our first thing we'll look at is immunohistic chemistry with antibodies against different markers of neurons and astrocytes. And then the ones that look like they're promising will corroborate this with electrophysiology and then further transplantation. So that's our in vitro approach. And so that's kind of ongoing. And then let me tell you kind of what we're thinking for in vivo approach. So, um, so you know, I, I um, have the fortune to um, co uh, collaborate with um, actually an AAV biologist back at the Salk and, and then now with Maro. But uh, one of the things we've learned is that um, AAV9, if you deliver it IV uh, intravenously, that it can um, actually target astrocytes in vivo. So let me go to sort of that slide. It's, things are kind of out of order, but yeah. Okay. So this is, this is the idea, so that um, we, um, we basically inject AV9, um, CREGFP, into the jugular vein. So here, here's like a cartoon of a mouse, and um, here's kind of the site we would inject right, right around there. So you know, you, you make a small incision, you uh, reveal the jugular vein, and it's under a, like a muscle or a ligament, so um, it doesn't just completely bleed out. And then you just give a small injection and, and of AAV into, P, and they're P15 pups, so you, you, you need a lot, but you don't need as much as you would if you're injecting an, an adult mouse. And then what, in a very, very small pilot study, and these are um, flocks, you know, res conditional allele. So the, um, the CRE with the GFP, would, uh, then we would um, look at the GFP positive cells at um, two, four, and six weeks post-infection. And, um, and as I, you know, I mentioned, and, we're, and we're still, some of this is still very much ongoing, is um, first we wanted to validate that they do, you know, through this IV route, um, preferentially infects astrocytes um, and not neurons. And if, if they do infect neurons, we want to understand, you know, where, where that is. And then we um, then want to confirm with astrocyte markers. We're also doing this in the background of an astrocyte reporter mouse to see exactly how much overlap there is with the AAV targeted astrocytes and you know a reporter expressed from an endogenous promoter. So. Um, so this is just sort of what it looks like. So this is like a, a more of a low magnification of the cortex, and um, these green GFP positive cells have this um, star-shaped stellate astrocyte morphology, and um, and we uh, you know then stained with an antibody to GFAP, and we do find that some of the GFP cells are in fact you know co-localized with um, an astrocyte marker. Um, this, uh, we know that the GFAP antibody doesn't work, and, and I mean, doesn't stain 100% of the GFAP positive astrocytes in the cortex, so that's why we're switching to the GFAP, uh, GFP reporter mouse to, to confirm this. Um, and so that's, that's our um, in vivo approach, and we're hoping to now, you know, tar uh, <laughs> deliver this, um, to try this out with additional transcription factors in various AAV vectors and um, with collaboration with Morrow's lab. Okay, and um, let me just go back to the in vitro a little bit, because this was our pilot studies to just to see if REST has, you know, any ability to convert, um, you know, an astrocyte-like cell to a neuronal-like cell. So, so, um, so we're doing this with primary astrocytes now, but in the very beginning what we actually first did was we isolated neural stem cells from our conditional knockout mice. And, and so before Cree, they're, they're wild type, right? 
And so then, you know, you isolate neural stem cells in proliferating conditions. So you have a dish and they're, they're growing. They actually normally grow as these balls, but when you can plate them and they flatten out and um, they're not expressing neuronal and astrocyte markers at this time point. Then um, you differentiate them in this co uh, combination of factors that promote astrocyte differentiation. So lift BMP with t high percentage of serum and over, you know, um, I would say two, one to two weeks, um, many of the cells start, I don't know if you can see, but they start expressing, you know, sort of this GFAP astrocyte marker and they look like these star-shaped cells. Um, but some of them are also expressing the neuronal marker. So this condition is not astrocyte, you know, it doesn't give 100% astrocyte differentiation. So a, there are a few neurons or neuronal cells that are, are there in the culture. And then um, the idea is at that point, we would infect cells with Cree virus, and, and we did that. And what we found, at least at one week, um, is that the majority of the cells start changing their morphology, and um, they start mostly expressing this neuronal marker, although some um, express both the neuronal and the astrocyte marker. Um, this is just to confirm the extent of knocking down or knocking out of the rest by qPCR. Um, so then if you looked at the percentage of marker positive cells, and again, this was, you know, just um, these preliminary studies, this, we looked at one week and two weeks, and um, the, um, the left-hand side is just the um, quantification of the CRE, the cells infected with the CRE GFP, compared to the cells infected with the control GFP. And, um, and what you see at one week post-infection is that um, the, light, the light color, it's, it's sort of washed out here, but there's a white bar. That's just GFAP marker alone. So that should be just the astrocyte. Then you've got the middle, the light gray, which is a, just the TUJ1, the neuronal marker alone. And then the third bar in each column is the dark gray. That's the uh, cells that express both markers. And so you, you sort of see, First, I want to point out that you do see an increase of the neuronal markers with Cree at one and then again at two weeks, um, compa you know, compared to the GFP controls. Um, but interestingly, you do see cells that express both markers that, um, you know, at both the one week and the two week. And I, I mean, I don't know what would happen if we went longer in time point, if that population would go down, which is what I would expect, or um, if, if they're just, you know, hanging out there and, and, you know, happy and, you know, they don't die. So, so I, we interpret that as cells that are sort of confused. They're, they're not sure if they should, um, you know, downregulate um, their astrocyte fate but they are possibly you know, starting to express their neuronal fate. So um, we, we sort of thought you know, it's possible that not uh, re removing this repressor of neuronal differentiation from an astrocyte may be only sort of partial, give us partial uh, trans differentiation. Maybe we need additional repression of the glial fate or we need additional inducers of the neuronal fate. So it's... it's um, it could be you know, one or more of these possibilities. And, and remember, these are also, I started with these with neural stem cells um, differentiated to astrocytes. So I think ideally, we would start with um, primary astrocytes. And then we, we can offset the, the caveat that we have contaminating neural stem cells in the culture that are just differentiating into neuronal cells. So our future plans on this project is um, the following. We want to continue our in vitro screen to um, identify and you know go from like large lists of factors to a smaller list, but once we get these smaller lists of factors, we want to directly go in vivo using AAV that you know that we can specifically target astrocytes in the cortex and and, and screen for um, direct um, uh, neuronal uh, trans differentiation, and so um, and so then uh, yeah that's what I basically said. So then I'm switching gears a little bit, and, um, and this is where I wanted to kind of get to, get to this notion that sort of there is a dark side of um, neural stem cells and adult neurogenesis that, that maybe um, we should pay a little bit more attention to. And so, um, and so on this, you know, I guess I, I want to get 
this slide. Things are kind of in different order. But going back to this slide, so remember I showed you that in the normal case, there, there's all these BRD cells. They're always lighting up in this inner granule cell layer. And they contribute to these granule neurons throughout life. And, and they, they're important for hippocampal-dependent learning and memory. Um, and particularly, they're important for um, separating or distinguishing subtle differences in patterns, okay? So they might not be totally required for all hippocampal memory, but it looks like the more complex the task is or the more similar the objects are um, that one needs to distinguish, that's when these newborn neurons in the hippocampus are, sort of come out and reveal their role to us. Um, and so, so um, but, but um, in the late 90s, um, you know, people have already found that after um, a very high uh, intensive seizure activity called status epilepticus, that um, you, you get this, you know, massive proliferation and you have ectopic granule neurons that, that um, you know, de novo in, in, the, in the hippocampus. And so, and, and so because, um, you know, a, a large percentage of epilepsies involve the hippocampus, you know, they're, they're classified as temporal lobe epilepsy. And in fact, a lot of the epilepsies that are resistant to drugs are temporal lobe epilepsies. We became really, really fascinated by the connection of, of adult hippocampal neurogenesis and epilepsy. And, um, and, and in work that um, I, we published you know, a while ago, we showed that um, if you actually induce um, uh, you know, this, this seizure-induced neurogenesis in rodents, in mouse and rats, and you actually gave the animals a histone deacetylase inhibitor like val valproic acid, you can suppress this abnormal proliferation and an ectopic neurogenesis, and you can um, improve the, the hippocampal learning and memory deficits that's associated with the, the seizure animals. So that's kind of the background and gave us some idea that th of, this, of this hypothesis, is that these acute seizures, um, and, and in, in people, what might trigger this, okay? So it could be um, like um, the most common causes are like um, trauma, traumatic brain injury, you know, motorcycle accidents, um, really bad, bad um, trauma to the, to the brain and skull. Um, genetics is also an un un underlying um, um, predisposition. Um, and there's also possible some connection to, you know, obviously like febrile seizures um, is, is um, um, in some, some individuals, um, high fevers, they can trigger status epilepticus. And so, so um, but then what happens is that after the first seizure, the first status, nothing happens. So there's a period, there's latent period, it could be years, and before the next seizure, the next seizure, and then as soon as you have one, two or more unprovoked seizures, now it's ep epilepsy. So, so, so what's going on in that latent period, okay? And, um, and if we can understand and uncover those mechanisms, that may, and maybe we can identify what are targets as anti-epileptogenic. Because all of, most of the drugs now are anti-convulsive. They are not designed um, to, be, to, to act as anti-epileptogenics. And the reason probably is because we're not, we don't have a good enough understanding of, of what are the mechanisms that lead to epilepsy. Um, as, as opposed to, and so we don't really have a way of, of basically finding those drugs. And so we're, we're hoping to tap in by studying this aberrant neurogenesis, which is hallmarked by, you know, increased proliferation, basal dendrites that, you know, project normally, abnormally into the hylus and not out to the molecular layer, things like that, that maybe we can, you know, identify these new anti-epileptic genic targets. And, um, and then also a, a very a, a common comorbidity is these cognitive changes that maybe we can also find new classes of drugs to treat um, the, um, the cognitive deficits in, in epilepsy. So this all gets back to um, um, what is the role of hippocampal neurogenesis and epileptogenesis. So it's, it's sort of controversial. So some of the studies suggest like if you ablate cells dividing dividing cells with Aris C, it's an it's a, you know, anti-mitotic drug. Um, if you just kill the dividing cells, 
um, now, it sh um, after seizures, you see a decrease in the number and, and frequency of these spontaneous recurrent seizures. Um, but other studies show that if you ablate neurogenesis before seizures, you don't affect the rate of seizure progression in generation. So, so what is it? What's the answer? And one of the issues with these studies is that the, uh, the way they were ablating are, is nonspecific, right? So whole brain irradiation, whole, you know, whole brain infusion of ARC, and, and I already told you that after seizures, there's, or maybe I didn't tell you, but there's a lot of this reactive astrocyte proliferation. You're going you're gonna to kill those astrocytes that proliferate. So you're not really specifically testing just the role of the neural stem cells and the newborn neurons. So, so we thought we would take a genetic approach, and we took advantage of this transgenic mouse that expresses um, thymidine kinase um, uh, behind the nestin promoter. And using this strategy, um, we can deliver gangcyclovir, um, give the animals gangcyclovir. Once they see a cell that expresses thymidine kinase, um, gangcyclovir will be phosphorylated and it will kill that cell. It will cause that cell to, uh, to commit suicide. And it, it, it's restricted to just that cell. So then, theoretically, then all of the dividing cells will be taken out and their progeny, but the quiescent stem cells will be left intact. And so then using this method, um, this mouse, we confirmed that after four weeks of gangcyclovir treatment, um, this is you know, a, a, um, the granule cell layer here. This is the vehicle-treated mice that have lots and lots of these. these are, this is a stain of double cortin, which marks the newborn neurons that the majority, maybe 95% of the double cortin new neurons are ablated. And, um, so that kind of suffices um, as, a, as a way of, you know, for us that we can specifically and genetically just kill these new neurons. Um, and some of them are still there, okay? So keep that in mind. <coughs> um, but the most of them are gone. Okay, and so then our idea is then we would, um, we would do this in um, two different cohorts of mice. And, um, and then we would induce status epilepticus, and we use pilocarpine, and pilocarpine is, a, is an acetylcholine receptor agonist. And those are, of course, those receptors are found throughout the body, but we can block the peripheral nervous system um, first, you know, its effects on, on pilocarpine. So only the, um, the brain, essentially, will be responsive to pilocarpine. So we get like whole brain um, status epilepticus, and we, and we let the animals have these seizures for, for three hours, and then we stop behavioral seizures with diazepam. So um, then um, now, now after we terminate seizures, they, they stop seizing, and then at about four weeks later, actually about two weeks later, they'll just have spontaneous seizures, unprovoked. Um, we'll catch them. You know, one, one mouse will have one a day or two a day. So we know that the, the mice are now having, are in this, you know, be in the latent period. And then we want to look at, uh, measure and quantify um, their seizures. So we have to implant electrodes at about four weeks, and then we can measure EEG, brain EEG, um, for two continuous weeks with video monitoring. So, um, we, we, we knew that this four-week time point after status was probably good to start measuring EEG because at histological level, we confirmed that a lot of the ectopic cells that are normally found in the vehicle, in, the, you know, in this hyalur region, are severely reduced. But they're not gone. They're still, but they are you know, severely reduced. And this is probably a consequence from these ablated new neurons. So, okay, so, we're, so we'll go ahead and start recording. And um, you know these are mice that are connected to a cable. Um, they're free moving, and they have four different electrodes: one in each hippocampus, and two, uh, one in the frontal, and and, uh, and the fourth in the occipital cortex. So then, and here is a section of the hippocampus. You can see this is typically where the electrodes are. Um, these wires are implanted. And these are depth electrodes, sort of in CA3. Okay, and so here are just some representative findings. Um, this is no, you know, four different electrodes, you know, you know cortical and then two hippocampal. This is no, um, you know, epileptiform activity. This is a very obvious, you know, um, 
EEG seizure um, on all four electrodes. So that's called a generalized seizure. And sometimes you'll only see the hippocampal ones, or sometimes you'll only see you know, one or the other. Those are partial. So we'll, we'll literally manually go in and count every, every seizure episode and um, blinded and, um, and, and do this, you know, um, of, of EEG data, you know, that's over 24 hours a day for, for two straight weeks. So what we found was very exciting. So we did find um, a reduction of these spontaneous EEG seizures in these GCV-treated mice. Um, and I'm, I'm showing you the cumulative spontaneous recurrent seizure counts, SRS counts, after the first three days, the next three days, the next th nine day, uh, three days, and so on and so forth. And what you can see is there's a reduction um, with the, you know, the GCV mice um, up to about 14 days, but at the very, sort of at the, you know, the last couple of days, uh, it barely is, you know, statistically significant. And we're thinking um, one possibility is that maybe because um, that there's still new neurons that we haven't completely ablated, that's one possibility, so they're still there. Um, they were sort of there, you could see it at the histological level. The other possibility is that, is that there's a population of dividing cells that are born post-status that we did not ablate, and, and those could also be contributing to some of this EEG spontaneous seizures. So, so we're going to try a, a paradigm where we could ablate cells, kill them before status as well as after status. Um, interestingly, although we, we saw a, a decrease in the number of spontaneous seizures, we did not see a change in the, the duration of each of the spontaneous seizures. And so then finally, I, wa I want to show you um, <coughs> what does this mean in terms of the behavior of the mice. So, um, so as I mentioned, a lot of uh, a common comorbidity for epilepsy, especially ones that involve the temporal lobe, the hippocampus, is um, learning and memory deficits. Um, so, um, so we decided, you know, we wanted to take these mice and go through the whole experimental scheme, but also do perform behavior. But we also wanted to look at just general activity um, and also some tests for anxiety, because it, the other thing is, is that epilepsy is associated with depression and anxiety. So, so um, we wanted to see if we could sort of model this or detect this in our mice, and then go on to um, hippocampal dependent learning and memory. Um, <laughs> So, so actually, I, I, um, I'll summarize because I'm running out of time a little bit. We did find that the mice were, um, they were, they were less active, the seizure mice, uh, compared to, you know, sham mice. Um, but, so one, you know, maybe you guys are thinking, well, they're having seizures all the time, so of course they're less active. But actually, then we lo looked at their activity throughout a 24-hour, turns out they're most active at 4 and 5 in the morning. And um, they continue to be active for about you know a few hours, and then they they gradually decline. So we learn that their probably their circadian rhythm is really um, disrupted. And so then we, we shifted their behavior testing to you know 5 a.m. And then every then they 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 were able we were able to do testing and um, and you know find that they could do behavior tests. It's just you have to find the right time when they're more active. And we also found that in the these open field and light dark tests. So normally, I don't um, the mice. They they're a very uh, they're afraid of being in a you know in a in the middle of a big field. They want to be at the edges, and they also don't like to be in light. You know, because I guess a hawk can fly over and just see them and eat them. So. So, um, so, so normal mice, you know, go to the periphery or go to the dark side of the box. But our seizure mice, um, in general, um, they didn't even want to go into the field to explore. They just stayed at the periphery. But interestingly, they, there's no difference with GCV. Um, so they're, they're anxious, but it looks like ablating new neurons doesn't affect that anxiety. Um, the most interesting thing we saw was with the novel location, which is a hippocampus-dependent test, as well as novel object, which is um, a non-hippocampus, it's a perianal cortex-dependent test. And this is how the test works. So the, the mice, um, they're you know, put, put in a box, and um, they're allowed to acclimate for a period of time. And then um, two different uh, two objects are placed in the same objects, and so they're allowed to sniff and, and explore them, touch them with their whiskers, familiarize. Then after one hour, 
the, the objects, the location changes and the mice are put back in. And, and if you have an intact hippocampus, um, and new neurons there, you, you go and explore a little bit longer, right? Because, oh, it's a different place, that's interesting. Um, and then what happens is you take out one of the objects and you put in a different object. And that is a test for the perianal cortex, which is um, a non-hippocampal. It's more of um, just recognition of objects as opposed to a memory of, of the location where those objects were. So, I, so using this paradigm, we, we could sort of separate out, you know, this, these two regions. And so, so again, um, if the mice are preferring this new location because, oh, it's novel, interesting, they should show a preference ratio more than 50%, right? Because 50% means that they, the new location is they, they go there just as much, they explore for just as much time as the previous location, meaning they don't recognize it's a new location. But these um, sham mice, they you know, have a higher than 50% preference ratio, meaning that their hippocampus you know, is preferring their new location. And you know, there's no difference between vehicle and GCV. But our seizure mice, um, the vehicle treated group, they have about a 50% average preference ratio. So this is consistent with seizure mice having hippocampal deficit in um, learning and memory. Uh, and, and, and the most exciting is that in the GCV group, they now have this you know, increased preference ratio to you know, 0.6 or even higher. So they almost uh, you know, like the sham mice. Um, and, and that's you know, correlated with their you know, reduced seizures that I showed before. And then, and I think the, um, the bottom line is on this novel object test, which is non-hippocampal dependent, they, um, the sham mice you know, have this higher preference ratio, as you would expect, and the seizure mice have deficit. Uh, because we do know that the perianal cortex suffers a lot. They have a lot of cell death in that region. And apparently, GCV-treated mice, ablated, ablation of new neurons in the hippocampus doesn't affect in this test. So it's telling us that the ablation of neurogenesis, you know, prior to um, status enhances um, learning and memory in a hippocampal specific um, way, dependent way, um, but not generally in, in other regions. So, so we're, you know, we're following up uh, to summarize, you know, I think we've shown pretty convincing evidence that um, that the, this population of new neurons, um, after uh, you know one type of injury like like seizure activity, could contribute to um, spontaneous recurrent seizures, to so some of the pathology that's um, associated with epilepsy development, and and by um, you know by uh, a, um, basically by uh, um, correlating this with the behavior that maybe this is also a way of, um, of reducing one of the comorbidities that is common with um, epilepsy. And so now we, in the future, we have a lot of more detailed histology planned. We all want to do the ablation neurogenesis before and after seizures and evaluate spontaneous recurrent seizure. We want to identify the molecular mechanism um, um, for this reducing epileptogenesis and improving hippocampal function. Maybe it involves rest again. And, I, and the, a slide I skipped um, previously, but we did find that pilocarpine induces rest mRNA and protein levels in the granule cell layer at this very short time point. So maybe that's involved in some of this you know, rest-dependent gene expression. And, and maybe we need to you know, block some of that. So we could use our conditional knockout to try to explore this. Um, but other mechanisms have been suggested to be important for epilepsy, like mTOR and GABA excitation. Those are also involved in those new neurons. So you know, maybe what we did by removing them genetically is, by, is basically reducing mTOR or reducing GABA excitation. And so, and so, you know, ultimately toward translation and, and you know, towards human is we would like to find um, drugs that are more relevant to these, this epileptogenic process. So, so um, we're hoping, you know, that this will, you know, help convince people in the field that we need to look right after status, you know, not wait years and years and years, but, but really that, that those initial, you know, neurogenesis changes are really important. Okay, so finally, um, I, I want to uh, acknowledge some of the people that did the work. Um, 
So all the reprogramming project I talked about is, is um, basically the project of a single graduate student, um, Becky, in the lab. So she's really excited and motivated to, to you know, continue working on this. Um, and then the epilepsy work is um, um, Kong Oak and um, Zane, um, two postdocs in the lab, have teamed up to, to try to figure this out. And um, also some of our collaborators, you know, back, back um, in the States. And um, I, I do want to um, say that um, all of this work, um, um, I, uh, some of this work I didn't have time to talk about involves um, doing s um, screening. We've been very interested in small molecules and chemical biology and, um, at UT Southwestern. So there I've worked on it with Jay Schneider and, and Maro's <coughs> met with him too. And um, um, they are um, very excited to have um, you guys who, um, come to Dallas. They wanted me to tell you, to um, all of you should come to Dallas to the upcoming AHA, American Heart Association meeting this fall, where um, Eric and Jay, right here, um, and their band will play um, and, and introduce you guys to um, Texas rock and roll. So thank you very much. <laughs>